So consumer and business credit. Let's start with the defining us in terms. First, what comes to mind when you think of business credit? Credit cards. Credit cards. Perfect income. Purchasing. Perfect. Financing. I would think there's several, very few businesses who are not operating with some form of credit, some form of debt that they're taking on, some form of loans. Open end credit. What is it? A loan arrangement in which there is no set number of payments. As the balance of the loan is reduced, the borrower can renew the amount of the loan up to a pre-approved credit limit, a form of revolving credit. So think of it as a form of revolving credit. Finance charge is gonna be the dollar amount that is paid for credit. The total of installment payments for an item less the cost of that item. APR, or annual percentage rate. Who can define it? Effect of a true annual interest rate being charged for credit must be revealed to borrowers under the Truth in Lending Act. The effective or true rate, remember when you see that term effective, we are talking about the true rate of the annual interest rate being charged for that credit. It's important to know that it must be revealed to the borrowers under the Truth of Lending Act. So Congress has enacted legislation. This is to ensure that everyone, without having to take this business class, this business math class, Everyone can look at their statement and sh we'll see what is the true or effective rate. Not the advertised rate, but what's the true rate for extending this credit. Unsecured loans. When you hear the word unsecured, all right, there's nothing back in it. So this is a loan that is backed simply by a borrower's promise to repay. There are no tangible assets being used as collateral to back the loan. Versus a secured loan is one that is being backed by a tangible asset that could be repossessed or sold if the loan, if the borrower defaults on the loan. Now, if you've ever walked into the bank and you've asked for a loan, you know, depending on the time and whom you were dealing with, you know, there were two types of arrangements that could have been extended to you. Revolving credit, loans made on a continuous basis and billed periodically. So a borrower is gonna make the minimum monthly payment and pay interest on the outstanding balance. So it's gonna be a form of open-ended credit extended by many retail stores and credit card companies. So again, think of your credit card, you have uh, maximum spending limit. And as long as you don't breach that limit, they're gonna to continue to extend credit to you, charging you finance charges each month on the funds that you have borrowed. And at any time you can go in and tap more credit up again to that pre-approved limit. All right, a credit card. Everyone see a picture of it. Uh, it's easy for the video. I even have a here. All right, so everyone should know the number. Your cards may have a hologram on them for security reasons. Mm -hmm. Company logo is going to be always up somewhere toward the top of it. Uh, the book's going to show you a visa. This is an American Express your account number and your name. This is what's gonna identify you to the card. 
Okay, now this particular card that I'm holding is authorized through a business. So on the identification, I see my number, and then down here, I see the corporation that's tied to this account, and then under that corporation, I see my name. So there are two individuals linked to this card. What are a lot of cards having now that's not shown on the example in the book? Chip. chip. The chip. Do all of your cards have the chips on them now? Yeah. I don't have any credit cards. Well, debit cards? Yeah, a debit card. Okay. <laughs> now, do credit cards, do they not have the three-digit codes on the back? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Do you have a three-digit code? Well, I don't see it in here, so I, I... And the reason, I don't know why they say that, ironically, with an American Express, you have a four-digit code in the front. I have a further three-digit code on the back. But if I call American Express or if I make a purchase with this card and they ask for the pin or the number to it after they swipe it, I'm always to give them that four digit code. Mm -hmm. Now the chip, again, interesting studies are going on right now. How much time we're wasting in life by inserting that chip. Yes. Yes. So I'm assuming it is it's for no reason. Uh, well, no reason. Why do we have chips? Well, it's a security. Mm -hmm. It's, it's supposed secure. to be more secure than. That's what, that's what I was talking about. It's more secure, but as far as retail, it had an important change to retailers. Um, it's supposed to prevent um, <laughs> hackers being able to hack into the systems, right? Correct. Because yeah, Target was the one that where yeah. all that started. Yeah. 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 Well, and think about what it did because of that. Now, before we had the chip, if your card was compromised, let's say you went to Target and you your card was you had fraudulent purchases from a Target, who assumed responsibility? Who was liable? Target. No. Credit card company. Oh. <laughs> because of the chip now, that liability has been switched to the retailer. So you had the credit card company really in favor of chip legislation, sure. and you had the retailers on the other side saying, no, we don't, we don't want it. But what they identified is a lot of the fraudulent purchases could have been caught at the store level. So again, the credit card company says they created, the, someone created, I'm going to give them credit, created the technology, required every retailer to purchase that technology, and now you're just going to ensure, again, I guess we'll see, time will tell how successful this is over the long term. Now, are all retailers required to purchase that technology? Now, there was a date a lot of them have the machines. There's a date of them. where it's slowly being rolled out. Meaning there was not just a concrete date that said everyone has to start using it on this date. But I think there was a gradual phasing in of the technology. I know I don't use everyone that I merchant with. I mean, I'm using the chip technology right now. Why is that more secure? This chip is supposedly only linked, now I know this number is only a link to this card, but this chip is supposed to have more underlying checks identifying it to that card. There's more information on here and more checks that they can do to authenticate that this is the card and that this card does belong to Charlie. You know, a lot of the way that they're cracking, in addition to breaching company policies, just realizing that there have been programmers write technology that does nothing but spin numbers. And as it's spinning numbers, at the same time, it's firing out purchases. And now it's doing this at, a, at an alarm at a faster rate than we can assume, but it's firing out those. 
doesn't care what they're trying to purchase in the first hit. So they'll know that an American Express, how many digits it has and how those digits are lined up. So it's gonna do nothing but sit here and spin numbers trying to find something that will match an, an American Express card. And then it would fire off all these purchases. Well, when it found one that hit, it immediately come back to the programmer. And that programmer knew that they had a very short period of time for them to go out and purchase the items, fraudulently purchase the items that they truly wanted. They might start out by just purchasing $10 items trying to get a hit. And then once they get it, you go out and get larger items. And some of the credit limits on these cards, you know, especially when you get into the businesses, it can easily get six figures. You start seeing black. If you ever see a black American Express, you're probably getting into seven figures. I hope everyone in this room secures a black American Express card one day. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are reserved for professional athletes, actors, technology gurus, people who they yeah, feel comfortable with. The elite. <laughs> don't, don't have any trouble <laughs> making payments. All right, credit reform. This has been something pretty hot in newsrooms over the last few years. How does credit card reform affect you? All right, I'll tell you some big items. Credit card companies have to tell you when they are planning to raise your rates and what reasoning they're using to raise those rates. To lessen the chance of bait and switch, they can't raise your rate in the first year. So they, can't they couldn't advertise a low rate just to get your business and then automatically, as soon as they got you to sign up, start ratcheting it up on you. Hmm. Big items when it comes to payments, standard payment, dates and times. So you're gonna see most of them now are running toward the end of the month or they have a fixed date that they will use every single month. They won't try to change it up on you. And most of them will run until 11.59 or some other standard cutoff. But once they commit to that, they wanna to continue to use that. Um, no two cycle or double billing. And payments directed to higher interest balances first. You know, prior to this credit reform, credit cards could take your balances. Let's say that you did have an introductory amount you applied for, and we're going to say it was 5%. Standard credit card rates, let's say, are 13%. Cash advances are, we'll call it 20%. Okay, if you transferred a balance over 5% and you're, they're earning 5% on it, and then you all of a sudden take a cash advance, Okay, when they go to, when you send your payment in, credit card companies could have always directed that toward that lower balance, that lower interest rate, making sure you're keeping the higher rate on the books, ensuring they're getting higher interest payments for extending the debt. So now under credit reform, they have to apply those payments to the highest debt first or the highest interest rate first. All right, reasonable penalty fees and protections. No fees of more than $25, $35 in special cases. Okay, no inactivity fees. So if you pay your card off and you're not maintaining a balance and you don't maintain that balance for some time, they can't cancel it for just, and say it's just for inactivity. One fee limit for a single transaction and a reevaluation of increases every six months. So again, as we started to see, well, I'm gonna go back and say over the last eight, nine years, as we've seen a lot of changes to credit reform, we'll even talk about mortgages later, and there's been a lot of changes to how mortgages, how we apply and are approved for mortgages, in the mortgage market, it went through a transformation there, a good transform phase. 
we've seen a lot of changes to credit reform. All right, let's start looking at some problems. All right, we're going to start with solving for how to calculate the finance charge and new balance by using an unpaid balance method. So find that in your text. So we're just gonna start out with dividing the APR by 12 to find the monthly periodic interest rate. All right, we ready? All right, we're gonna pick on Carl. Carl's got a credit card account with an annual percentage rate of 15%. So the APR is 15%. His previous month's balance is $318.20. During July, he charged $35.50 for dry cleaning. So in July, for dry cleaning, he made a $45 payment. He bought him a new pair of shoes for $59.25. Went to a restaurant and had a bill of $41.10. We'll just call that a food. Purchased medicine for $19. And he received a credit of nine dollars and twelve cents. I'm going to put that in parentheses just to note a credit. All right, calculate the finance charge for July, and what is his new balance? So, who has the steps that we're going to use? What was step one? Divide the APR by 12. All right, we've got to divide. So we're looking at the periodic rate. And to solve for that, what are we going to do? Divide the APR by 12. So in this case, the APR is 15%. Divided by 12. So the periodic rate is 1 and a quarter percent. What's step two? Calculate the finance charge by multiplying the previous month's balance by the periodic interest. All right, calculate the finance charge by taking the previous balance. So we're going to call this the finance charge. I'm going to abbreviate FC. By taking the previous balance and multiplying it by periodic rate. So, what was the previous balance? $318.20. 
$318.20. Multiplied by the periodic rate of 1.25%. What's the finance charge? Round that up, $3.98. Ah. What's next? Um, all right, so he got a credit here and then he made a payment here. So the previous balance was 318.20. We have to add in our finance charge. Total purchases is sixty dollars. Oh. Or no, mm -hmm. that's not right. Total purchases one fifty four eighty five. Subtracting now this credits of fifty four twelve. I got 154.75. What you get? 154.75. Okay. Oh, man. 154.75. My example in the book is SIN 3520. Oh. Okay. No, it's 85. It is? Oh. Yeah. And then the credits are 5412. So if we take yeah. 31820 plus three dollars and ninety-eight cents, add in our total purchases of 154.85, and then subtract our credits of fifty-four dollars and twelve cents. Four twenty-two ninety-one. Is that fifty-nine twenty-five for shoes? Yes. Oh, forty-one ten for food. I thought you said forty-one dollars for food. That's where I'm coming up to. So four twenty-two ninety-one is the new balance. So remember, when you get your credit card statements, that is that periodic rate is paid is charged against what that balance was at the end of the previous reporting cycle. Now, starting the next month, again, we would take this four hundred twenty-two dollars and ninety-one cents, multiplying it again by the periodic rate. And we're going to assume this periodic rate will not change unless you change the APR up here. All right. We good? No. Professor, what is that? The 19, is it is it 12X or is it RX? RX, abbreviation for compression. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying. All right, I'm good. I'm taking notes for three people, so. <laughs> Direct everyone to the video. Uh, yeah, I am. 
And there's this feature on there that will help. You might not like it, but it's called pause. Because if you pause again, I'm going to stand on your, you're going to continue to see me on your screen. <laughs> but you can pause it and you'll see. All right, now to calculate the finance charge and new balance using the average daily balance. You with me? All right, so we're going to look at an open ended credit example here. We'll say Morgan has a revolving credit account with a 15% annual percentage rate. So again, 15% APR. The finance charge is calculated by using the average daily balance method. The billing date is the first day of each month. And the billing cycle is the number of days in that month. So we're going to start billing on day one and continue to build, bill until the end of the month. So during the month of March, I'm going to say that Morgan showed the following activity. Okay, let's look here. His previous balance. So we'll start with the previous balance, and I'm going to say it's two fifteen, two hundred fifteen dollars and sixty cents. And he went to Sports Authority in golf season, and he's going to make a purchase of one hundred twenty-five dollars and eleven cents. Stops and gets gas at Texaco for $23.25. Bless you. Thank you. Makes a payment of $75. Gets a credit from Amazon. And I abbreviated AMZN, that's their stock ticker, for $54.10. He makes another purchase at HL Manger for $79. Another purchase at Texaco. We're going to do two more of these for $19.43. And he goes to Dollar General, and spends $94.19. All right, now what we're going to solve for here using the average daily balance method, how much? is the finance charge for August, and what is Morgan's new balance? So we're gonna solve and say, what is the finance charge and two, what's the new balance? All right, what's step one? We'll create a chart. We're gonna create a chart. So I'm gonna hold off on the new balance right now. Well, what's step one? We've gotta find this periodic rate. Mm -hmm. 
how do we get the periodic rate? The APR divided by 12. Divided by 12. So in this case, the APR is 15% divided by 12. Periodic rate, 1.25%, just like our last example. All right, now how are we going to do this chart? We're going to start out with dates. We need to know the number of days. Remember, we're solving using the average daily balance method. We want to look at activity. The unpaid balance and then the daily, the daily balance. So what were the dates? We're going to say that the previous balance we said was on the, so we're looking at March. March 1st. So March 1. Mm -hmm. And then let's give this some dates. All right, Sports Authority, we're going to say March 10th. And then we're going to, we'll say March 7th. March 7th. The 7th, the 10th, the 12th, the 12th. Seventeenth, twenty-third, twenty-third, twenty-fourth, and the twenty-fourth, all in March. All right. So, what are our first dates? We are going to have from March first to March sixth. Because remember, on day seven, so from March 1st to the 6th, you're going to carry a balance. So for six days, we are carrying the previous balance of $215.60. So the unpaid balance, how are we going to solve for the daily balance. Sum of the daily balances divided by the days in the billing cycle. Mm -hmm. All right, so $215.60 multiplied by six. $1,293.60. Now on the second item, March 7th, we come in here, we're going to make a purchase. So for March 7th through the 9th, we're accounting for three days. What do we do on this day? Sports Authority. We charge $125.11. So what is our unpaid balance? Uh, $340.71. $340.71. $340 now again, what is the daily balance? $340.71 multiplied by three. 
$1,022.13. Now, March 10th through the 11th. We have two days. And what do we do here? We charge $23.25. What's the unpaid balance? $340.71. We add in the $23.25 and we get $363.06. For two days, $727.92. Now, let's switch gears. March 12th through what? 16th. The 16th. How many days? Five days. Now, what happens here? Makes payment seventy five dollars. We make a payment, so I'll mark that payment here with a subtraction symbol. What's our unpaid balance? Uh, six hundred forty six ninety two. Whoa! Watch yourself now. Watch yourself. <laughs> Do it wrong. <laughs> Watch yourself. $363. Subtract out the payment of $75. Should give us oh, an unpaid balance of $288. Oh, wow. And 96 cents. Oh, I, I was looking at something else. <laughs> Again, for five, for five days, $1,444.80. I had another amount up there, that's why I was looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> I had a daily balance instead of the unpaid balance. <laughs> All right, so now let's look here. What do we have next? March 17th through the 22nd. Have a credit. Oh. Now, so at? six days, you're right. Okay. On this day, we have a credit from Amazon for $54.10. Again, because it's a credit, we're going to be subtracting. What's the unpaid balance? $2. $234.86 for six days. What's $234.86 multiplied by six? 1,409 dollars and what sixteen cents. One thousand four hundred nine dollars. Zero. I'm like, how much time do you want me to repeat it? All right, one thousand four hundred ninety dollars and what? Sixteen cents. Just a little, just a little math fun. Just a little math fun. All right, what do we do here on March twenty third? He's going to double dip here. So from March 23rd, we only have that one day. So March 30, 23rd for one day, we have purchases of $79 and $19.43.
So what's the unpaid balance? So I didn't do anything spectacular here. I just 333.29. 333 dollars and 29 cents for one day. 333.29. Oh, it was 333.29. Yeah, it's, I've got 333.29. 333.29. 333.29. 333.29. I had it right there and didn't have it right on there. And then finally, on March 24th, he goes to Dollar General. But remember, we start our billing on the first day of the month, and we assume it's to the last day of the month for each of the months that we're solving for. So how many days are there in March? 31. All right, so we're going to have March 24th through the 31st. We have charges of $94.19. Unpaid balance is? $427.48. For eight days. $3,419.84. All right, and once you get to here, we, pre we went to the end of our activity. If I solve this up, I'm going to have 31 days. So there's going to be your first check to ensure that you do have 31 days of activity being reported here. And now you're going to sum over here. $9,650.74. Now, let's go all the way back. So I'm going to say the balance. I'm going to come over here and for the 31 days we need to solve for the average daily balance and to solve for the average daily balance how do we solve for that we're going to take the daily balance and divide it by the number of days so in this example, our daily balance was $9,650.74, divided by the 31 days of March. $311.31. cents. Now let's go right back to how we solved the previous example. <coughs> so again, the way I look at it is this is showing you that each day, this is a revolving loan, and I mean each day you're tapping to it, your interest is going to be calculated on the time period for what you're holding that balance. So our finance charges. How do we solve for finance charge? <laughs> Take the average daily balance multiplied by the periodic rate. The average daily balance was $311.31. Our periodic rate was 1.25%. So what's our finance charge? 3 dollars and 89 cents so now we're ready to solve for the new balance what were we asked to solve for was it not the finance charge 
in the new balance. So in part A, this is our answer. So, and then in step two, we were asked to solve for the new balance. How do we get the new balance? I'm gonna take the previous balance plus the finance charge. Adding up all the purchases and subtracting any credits. So the previous balance was $215.60 plus the finance charge $3.89. What were our total purchases? $340.98. $340.98. And then we can subtract out the payment and the credit. $125.10. So the new balance is $431.07. All right, lines of credit. Who wants to tell me what a line of credit is? Good. Line of credit, somebody. Pre-approved amount of open-end credit based on borrower's ability to pay. Pre-approved line of credit. Open the tap based on a borrower's ability to pay. What are some factors that will probably go in to determine your ability to pay? Credit history. Credit history. Probably income. Debt to income ratios. How much income is that debt already? What ratio is the debt consuming of that income already? All right, U.S. prime rate. What do we say here? All right, U.S. prime rate, the lending rate at which the largest and most credit-worthy corporations can borrow money from banks. What's our prime rate today? If you've got internet access on your phone or you're standing in a computer, I showed you how to get that last... Uh, Wouldn't wait. it be like 2.1? Maybe not. 3.75. All right, therefore, there we go. So again, the credit worthy corporations can borrow money from one bank to the next. The interest rate of most all other lines of credit, remember last week I said the most all other lines of credit are tied back to this number. So if we say that a line of credit is based on a borrower's ability to pay, and then U.S. Prime is the rate in which the most credit worthy corporations can borrow money. 
So when it says the most credit worthy, it means those that are most likely to be able to pay. Okay, I'm gonna pick on some companies here. General Electric. I'm gonna assume General Electric can pay its bills better than any individual in here, myself included. Exxon Mobil. Okay, I'm looking at corporations here who have very solid financials. And again, those that would be deemed very credit worthy by the rating agencies. If that's the rate that they can borrow money at, everything else is gonna be based off of this. So again, you can expect if they are charged that rate, we're gonna be charged something higher than that. And it's always important to watch how that's tracking because again, as that rate changes, then our, the rates that we pay are gonna change as well. We're gonna change by some factor of what prime is. All right, I showed you last week, easiest way to get uh, prime rate one, I'm assuming everyone in here did a Google search real quick. Go to the Wall Street Journal, you can find it. Go to Bloomberg.com, you can find it. Go to uh, Bankrate.com, you'll probably find it there. I do know you'll find it in those two publications. All right, so let's use an example of a line of credit. I see the time right here, and I'll probably give you through this example. Um, we're not going to go much longer before a break. All right, so firm has a 75,000 line of credit. So a line of credit, I'll abbreviate it with an LC. The annual percentage rate. So we're gonna set the APR at prime, and this is how you usually see these rates. Prime plus four and a half percent. Now again, someone who extended credit to any individual here based on this term is gonna be protected from rising interest rates. If prime is raised, we see where our rate is going to raise. So if you're being charged right now 3.75 plus four and a half, you see that as the federal US prime rate was raised, your effective rate of what you pay is going to rise as well. And it's gonna rise by the same relation as the Fed rate. All right, on November 1, we have a balance of 12,300. And on November 7th, what we do on November 7th? Firm's going to borrow sixteen thousand seven hundred to pay for merchandise, and on November twenty-one, we're going to borrow another eight thousand eight hundred. On November twenty-six. we are going to make a $20,000 payment. How many days are in November? So I'm gonna put a note over here that our billing cycle is gonna be equal to 30 days. <laughs> All right, so we're going to say the current prime rate, so we're going to define prime here as 8.5%. And 
we're going to be asked to solve for what's the finance charge. And two. <clears throat> What's the new balance? All right, so what's our APR going to be equal to? Let's solve for this first. <coughs> but remember, prime plus four and a half, and we set prime at. So prime is going to be equal to 13%. So we're going to set up an example of just what we did before. We're going to have the date, the date, the activity. We're going to have the unpaid balance and the daily balance. All right, so we're going to start on November 1st, and again, we have 30 days. So November 1st through the 6th, we have six days, and our activity is going to be the previous balance. And what is our previous balance? What's the previous balance? 12,300. 12, now, I didn't give you that up here, but remember, that's the amount we're starting with. So that would have been our previous balance. So in October, this would have been the month, this would have been the balance that we rolled over into November. So again, 12,300. On a daily balance of six days, what is our daily balance? 73,800. Now we're going to have November 7th through what? The 20th. 14 days. Don't get tripped up where you're just subtracting here. Make sure you actually count the number of days because we are including that first date. Okay, so for 14 days, we have a charge of 16,700. The unpaid balance is $29,000 for 14 days. What's our daily balance? $29,000 multiplied by 14. $406,000. Now, November 21st, we start back up. And we're going to go through the 25th. For five days. 
On November 21st, we charge 8,800. Unpaid balance, if I do this in my hand, 37,800. For five days, what's the daily balance? $189,000. Now we have November 26th. And we have just said that there were 30 days in our billing cycle. We'll take that through the end of the month. And we have five days. And on November 26th, we made a payment of $20,000. Seventeen thousand eight hundred would be our unpaid balance. And we carried that for five days. Eighty-nine thousand. Eighty-nine thousand. Now again, a quick check. I should have thirty days here. And what's my average daily balance? $757,800. All right, right back to the other example. First thing we got to solve for is the average daily balance. How am I going to do that? I'm going to take the daily balance and divide it by days. So 757,800 divided by 30 days. $25,260. So our finance charge, we take the $25,260, and I'm going to multiply it by what? Where do we get, what is 0.13 represent? Uh, APR. All right, so 0.13. Who agrees with that? We forgot to do something up here. Yeah, I can't disagree with it. Remember your APR annual percentage rate. First, got to take to get our periodic rate. We're going to take 13% divided by 12. What does that come up with? Point zero one. Zero eight or zero one zero one point zero eight. Yeah. The annual percentage rate is thirteen percent. Periodic rate and our period is one month here. Breaking this down, our periodic rate is one point zero eight percent. So my finance charge for the month of November is going to be twenty five thousand two hundred and sixty multiplied by the periodic rate. Two 
$272.81. So our finance charge is $272.81. Now for the new balance, remember, take the previous balance, add in the finance charge, add in your purchases, subtract any payments and credits. So the previous balance was 12,300. Our finance charge was $272.81. Our purchases sum to be $25,500. And our credits here, the payments for $20,000. So the new balance is going to be All right, be familiar with the terms installment loans, mortgages, down payments, cash for purchase price, and amounts financed. All right, let's first wrap up business math. All right, so I said be sure you get familiar with the terms and let's flip over to an example of calculating the total deferred payment price and the amount of a finance charge on an installment loan. Here we go. And I want you to think if any of you have purchased a home before, think of this example. This could apply to you. All right, Orlando had the option of paying twelve thousand five hundred in cash. So he can pay $12,500 in cash or financing a car with a four year installment loan. So cash or finance for four years. And we're gonna say buying an auto. Okay, the loan is going to require a 15% down payment. So 15% down and equal monthly payments of $309.90. Now, if you go and purchase a car, most people, when you go in, you probably ask, What's the purchase price? And more importantly, what's it gonna cost me per month? And I mean, truth of the matter, most consumers focus on, is that monthly payment affordable? What I'm gonna show you here is, after you identify, is it affordable? How to calculate what is the effective rate that you're paying for that loan? Now that's where you can make it hopefully more affordable. Knowing that rate would allow you to shop it among other lenders. All right, so what's the total finance charge on the loan? So we're asked to get the finance charge. And then two, what's the total deferred payment price? What's it gonna cost? 
<clears throat> okay, so looking in your book, what are we going to do first? First, we want to solve for the down payment. <clears throat> and what's the down payment? Well, it says we've got to put 15% down. So the purchase price is 12500 And we're either going to pay cash for it or finance it. So the down payment is going to be equal to 12500 times 15%. Or... $1,875. So how much are we financing? The purchase price is $12,500. We're going to put a down payment of $1,875. So our purchase price or the amount financed is going to be sixteen thousand, or excuse me, ten thousand six hundred and twenty-five dollars. Oh. What's the total amount of our installment payments going to be? Your monthly payment amount. Monthly payment amount times the number of monthly payments multiplied by the number of monthly payments. So four year, so forty eight months. Oh. All right, so here we go. The amount of finance charges are what? Remember, our total installment payments are fourteen thousand eight hundred and seventy-five dollars and twenty cents. Subtract out the amount financed. $4,250.20 is our finance charge. And now the total deferred payment price is what? We're going to take the total installment payments. What are we going to do? Add back in our down payment. What do we get? $16,750.20. Now, an easy decision to make on this, if you did have the $12,500 to pay cash for it, would it be better to pay 12,500 saving this amount of finance charges? Well, the obvious answer is what is the alternative that you could do with this 12,500? Could you choose another option? If you didn't pay cash for it, you'd still hold this 12,500. 
Would there be another option that you could do with that over a four year period that would yield a benefit at least equal to, hopefully greater than $4,250? <clears throat> the answer is no. We would probably go this route, realizing that this is what you're going to pay for that car that you purchased at $12,500. Now, if any of you have purchased mortgages, and especially if you did a 30 year, Go home, make sure you are relaxed, <laughs> and run that over a 30 year, and look at the total cost of what you're paying for that piece of real estate. Twice as much almost. <laughs> All right, let's calculate the regular monthly payment. You know what, let's, uh, let's look at an example. Calculate the regular monthly payment. Now we're gonna use an installment loan using add-on interest. All right, so here we go. Caroline, I'm gonna buy furniture with a 6%. We're buying furniture. 6% add on interest. The purchase price of the furniture is 1,000. $1,500. Bank's going to require a 10% down payment and equal monthly installments for two years. So equal installments. <coughs> for two years. All right, so what is the amount financed? Purchase price is 1500. We're required to put a 10% down payment. So we're going to finance 90%. 90% of $1,500 is $1,350. Okay. Finance charge. How are we going to solve for the finance charge? Well, you would take the amount finance, <clears throat> multiplied by the rate. So we're charged 6%. <coughs> now, what do I need to do first? right after this. What's the 6% going to assume? What time period? So when It's a year. And our installments are over two years. Times two. Oh, 
$162. Installment payments. Is what? Our down payment plus the finance. are going to be the total installment divided by what? The number of months. So we're solving for what is her monthly payment. All right, All right. I'm refer over to the APR installment table in your book. What page is that on? 429. Page 429. Now, if you're at the step, Here's how we're going to read that. This is how we're going to solve the calculate the finance charges for $100 finance. Step one is we're going to take the finance charge per 100. All right, so look down at the number of payments column to the number of payments of the loan in question. So again, here's where you're gonna read up and down and across, and you're gonna find the match. When you do that, you're gonna find a factor. And again, that factor is what would be multiplied to solve for again, $100 worth of finance. So what is the charge to solve for financing $100 of debt you can also refer to this table in the book. All right, let's do a quick, let's see. no problem on using this table and that's gonna wrap up this chapter. All right, Charlie is going to purchase appliances for $4,500. So appliances. And I'm going to purchase them for $4,500. I'm going to make a $500 down payment. with an installment loan for 24 months. So a two year, and my payments are gonna be
$190 per month. Using that table in your book, solve for the APR. Okay, what's the first thing you have to do? Go back to the steps in your text. And once it says step one. It tells you that you're gonna to have to solve for the finance charge. <coughs> okay, so what's my total payments going to be? My monthly payment. So what's my total payments? Four thousand five hundred sixty. Four thousand five hundred and sixty dollars. So my finance charge is going to be equal to what? Purchase for forty five hundred, and I put a down payment of five hundred. So, how much am I financing? Four thousand. What's my finance charge? $4,060. Well, my finance charge is going to be equal to $5,600. $560. Because my purchase price is $4,000. And my total installments are $4,560. So we'll put it over here, $560. Looking at the steps in your text, what am I gonna multiply this 560 by? Table is by one hundred. And if you look back, you see step one your finance charge multiplied by one hundred divided by the amount financed. So the amount I'm financing is. $4,000. So our finance charge per 100 is going to be equal to fourteen. Now use the table in your book. Tell me what the interest is. So remember, all we had to solve for the finance charge per 100 is to put it in related to your table. Because your table is going to show you per 100. Mm -hmm. 
This is the highest charge. Um, one hundred. Divided by the amount financed. And now if I look at this table in the text, And the closest that we're going to get is if you look at the column of 13 percent, 24 payments, you get a match up at 14.10. So that's telling you that it's going to cost 13% to finance this loan. Now, there was nothing that I got exact on that, but I matched that as close as I could get using that table. So at 13%. Why would you use 13%? I guess that's where I'm getting lost. You're getting it from this book. On the chart, on the chart. Um, 429. Yeah, I have the chart, but I'm trying to why are we using 13%? You're getting the 13% right here. So if I go to 24 payments, and I'm trying to solve for that $14, that's as close as I can get to $14. 14.10. Oh, okay. And that shows me that 13%. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions?